Hello, everybody. Welcome to another lunch seminar. This one joint between the IDE and the IDSS at MIT. We are really thrilled to have with us Phil Menzer from Indiana University, where he heads up the Observatory on Social Media and is going to talk to us, obviously, about what's going on with social media and the research underway in his group to try to understand how information spreads virally and what, what kind of tools, what kind of countermeasures can we take to affect the online manipulation of opinions. Uh, Phil, like a lot of our panel, uh, like a lot of our speakers is happy to have people chime in with questions. So let's follow standard practice. Please turn off your camera and microphone unless you'd like to ask a question or until you'd like to ask a question, in which case, go ahead. We will leave some time at the end. So if you'd like to wait, that's great. If you'd like to type your questions into chat, that's also great. And we will monitor those and tee those up for Phil. So with that, Phil, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for having me. It's an honor. Uh, let me start my uh, slides. So as Andy was saying, I'm gonna tell you about research going on at the Observatory on Social Media here at uh, Indiana University in Bloomington. And um, in particular, I'm gonna talk about different ways in which the mechanisms on online virality uh, are, being, are being manipulated. So let me start with this picture just to uh, present a typical object that we study here. We look at diffusion networks. So a network like this, the nodes represent uh, Twitter accounts, for example, and the edges represent ways in which a piece of information it goes from one person to another, in this case, through retweets. And a network like this represents the spread of a particular piece of information. So in this particular case, it's links to this particular article, which happens to be a fake news article that was quite uh, viral during the uh, uh, 2016 election. I'm sure many of you have seen it. It was from uh, the conspiracy site Infowars, and it was making the claim that the uh, Clinton campaign was uh, involved in satanic rituals. It was actually a precursor of the Pizzagate claims and later on the QAnon uh, conspiracies. Um, so when we look at a network like this, it, 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 some things pop out. So first, first of all, we can identify the super spreaders. We can identify those accounts that are playing a key role in amplifying, in, in, in generating the message and spreading it like the big nodes at the center. The size of the node here is the number of retweets. And those are not surprisingly accounts associated with the source itself, uh, like Alex Jones and Infowars. And then you see a bunch of accounts that are you know, not quite as influential, but they play a key role in amplifying the message. And these are these kind of reddish uh, nodes that you see a little bit uh, towards the periphery. And the reason they're colored red um, is because they're likely automated. Uh, these are accounts that we, you know, we, we, I'll tell you more later about our machine learning tools uh, to, to recognize uh, social bots. And those are likely bots that just automatically retweet everything that comes from certain accounts, in this case, Infowars. And a lot of humans we are shown here, likely humans are shown here in blue, are exposed to, to, to these through these amplification efforts. Um, so one thing that we look at when we uh, take many of these pieces of information, not a single one, like in this particular case, and we aggregate, and we look at simply, you know, the simple statistics is like how big these networks are, how many people are sharing a piece of information, or how many tweets have a link to, as in this particular case, a low credibility uh, article. And we look at these distributions of, these, uh, of this popularity, and, uh, and we notice that uh, statistically, the, the distributions for, of popularity for low credibility claims and for credible claims, for example, from fact-checking sources, they're not that different from each other. Although if you notice, the tail is even expands even further for low credibility claims, which is you know, in keeping with the results of Sinan and other people shown that uh, low credibility stuff goes even more viral. So what is the reason? Why, why is, is junk uh, uh, spreading virally? So to explore that, that question, what, one thing that we do here methodologically is we use some agent-based models. We try to capture a few salient features of 
whatever system we're trying to model, for example, a social network where information is spreading from node to node. Um, so we might look at the structure of the network. When we build this network, we might look at the fact that uh, agents have a feed and things posted by their friends appear on their feed and they appear in their feed in a certain order. And, and also people have limited attention. They don't necessarily look at every piece of information in their feed. They might only pay attention to a portion of it. So these are some of the factors that we can explore through models and then see, you know, build what if scenarios and, and see what happens. Um, and so what, uh, an interesting result is that we find that there are two key ingredients of this model that are sufficient to explain the emergence of these viral patterns. And viral patterns that I'm referring to is the ones that I showed you in the previous plot where the distribution of popularity has this long tail. So in other words, most things are not viral, but a few things go very, very, very viral. So for example, the structure of the network is, is a very important component. If the, if the network is a random network, then you, then you don't see this long tail. But if the network it looks like a real social network, which means it has hubs and it has community structure, uh, clustering, then uh, some things are going to go viral. Now, in this particular model here, uh, each piece of information that is spreading is just a random number. It doesn't have any particular uh, fitness or quality or importance to it. So random things are going to go viral. And this is inevitable. It's, it's, it, it's not just because they have anything special, but it's for these two reasons. One is, again, the structure of the network. And the second one is that the, the fact that the agents are not able to process all the information in their feed. They have some limited attention. So with some probability, they look at something. Then with some probability, they look at something else. And at some point, they stop. So we have a parameter. Uh, describing that. And, um, and you only see the emergence of this virality pattern, this long tail, when the attention is, is limited. So these are two important ingredients, the structure of the network and the finite attention, and both of them can be hacked. So the rest of the talk, I'm going to tell you about how these two particular ingredients can be, can be manipulated. So let's start with the network itself. Um, Filippo, could I ask yes. a quick question? This is Sinan. Of course. Hi, Sinan. Uh, good to see you. Uh, so could you explain that second one to me a little bit better, the attention? So if everyone gave a lot of and full attention, why wouldn't things go viral? What What, what is the limitedness of the attention? How does that relate to virality? It, it seems almost counterintuitive. It seems like if people had more attention to pay to... Uh, consume and spread things that more more things would go further. In that case, so imagine in the limit in which you connect everybody with everybody else and everybody sees everything else, right? So then what, what the system would converge to is a normal distribution where everything has the same chance of, of being shared. And so the virality of each object would be similar to that of every other object. And then you would have kind of like, a, you know, not, not a broad distribution. You would have a narrow distribution, something more like an exponential distribution or, you know, Gaussian. So, um, so, so, you're, so you're, the, the, the definition of virality is almost the separation of those far spreaders from right. the rest of the distribution. And you're saying right. that if attention was infinite, uh, then everything would be viral rather than nothing would be viral. Everything would have the would same amount of attention, right? right. So you, whether we call it viral or not, but we would right. observe a distribution here that would be like this dotted line, uh, which is basically, you know, uh, more like an exponential distribution. You know, the, 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 uh, you know, the, the number, the popularity of the meme would go down uh, more quickly. You wouldn't have these, these outliers, these, these super popular memes because uh, there is there would be no inequality in some sense it would just be I like see. every everything would, okay. would have the same chance of receiving attention on the other hand uh, okay. if you have a, a lower amount of attention let's say you can you look at only of five things out of your uh, you know out of your feed then you could have you could break that symmetry okay a few things would get seen and then would retweet. And then at some point they would spread within the community and would probably reach a hub 
because again, the other important ingredient here is the structure of the network. Once they reach a hub, then they have more chance to be, uh, to be amplified. Okay, and then it. at that point, they're gonna end up on somebody's top screen and then they're gonna be seen again. Got it. So at some point, this just creates a, let's say a feedback loop, uh, which then is amplified by the inequality of the network itself. Perfect, thank uh, you. That's, that's an intuition. We could probably yeah. talk much more at length about uh, what's going on, but that's my sort of hand wavy intuition about that. Thank you. Okay, no, thank you. That's a very good question. So uh, let's look at uh, some features about the network itself first. Uh, so uh, let's, let's start with this idea of, of virality and how it connects to, to the community structure in particular. And to do that, let me start with this concept I'm sure many of you have heard of, you know, uh, simple contagions versus complex contagion. So a while back, uh, we tried to characterize, you know, which memes uh, are, are spreading like, uh, like, you know, like uh, diseases We had simple contagion and, and what through complex contagion. And it turns out that the majority, the majority of, of memes or hashtags in this particular case, uh, which are the ones that are uh, not particularly viral, uh, they require multiple exposures before somebody reshares them. So they, 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 they follow the complex contagion pattern. But the small minority of things that go super viral, uh, in fact, they are shared even after very, very few um, exposures. And so they really spread more like, you know, like, uh, you know, biological, uh, biological viruses. But the typical case is that of complex contagion. Now, what does, why is that related to, you know, to the structure of the network? Well, uh, communities, dense communities with lots of triangles uh, play into that in two ways. One is that if, let's say that one person retweets uh, uh, another person, okay, and they're in the same community. Now, because we have many triangles, now you will have lots of different other nodes in the same community that now are exposed to not one, but by two instances of that, of that meme or that message, that hashtag. And so a single act, a single retweets can cause a cascade of multiple exposures because of the high clustering coefficient, because there are many triangles in this, in this dense community. So the community acts as, as an amplifier because of complex contagion. And then the other element, of course, is that communities have strong homophily, right? People tend to be in the same group because they have similar ideas. And so when they are exposed to something by multiple members of that community, that something is probably something that is aligned with their own beliefs. And so through the well-known biases like confirmation bias and selective exposure and so on, uh, people in the same community are more likely, of course, to, uh, to reshare. So the presence of communities here plays a central role in amplifying, uh, in amplifying things. And when we look at uh, the community structure of the fusion networks, for example, US politics, we see, and we have seen now for 10 years, that there is a very robust echo chamber structure. That is that there are two major communities, the right wing and the left wing, and they're very, very dense. And they tend to be quite homogeneous. And this is true whether you look at the Twitter follower network or the, or the diffusion network, for example, through retweets or quotes or mentions, whatever, what have you. And so that's represented here by, the, by, by, the, by these two communities and by the callers, of course. And then if you look at the size of the nodes here, that is proportional to the fraction of the links shared by one account that are pointing to low credibility sources. So the big nodes are the ones that are responsible for more of the misinformation. And they tend also to be associated, they, to be included in these, in these uh, echo chamber-like uh, communities. So what is the role of, of the social media platforms in creating this situation where you have these dense communities where information spreads very, very virally inside? Uh, so to answer that question, we again went to one of our agent-based models. Um, now, two important ingredients in this model are one is social influence. So this is a bounded 
um, uh, uh, model, confidence model. So um, uh, you, if you are exposed to an opinion that is sufficiently close to yours, there is some small chance that you will, your opinion will change a little bit towards that uh, opinion that you're exposed to from your, from your neighbors. And then the second ingredient is that the structure of the network can change itself through unfriending, for example. So if you, if you, have, if you see something posted by somebody and you really, really strongly disagree with it, then with some small probability, you unfollow them. And in this particular model here, you replace that edge with a completely random edge, but we, of course, you, we can explore different mechanisms. So let me run it. At the beginning, the opinions here, which are represented by the color, this is a very, very simple model, one dimensional opinion. Uh, the, at the beginning, they're quite spread. So you have the whole range uh, from, from blue to red. And then as the simulation goes on, you can see the dashed lines. These are edges that are cut. These are the unfollows. And they're replaced with new random connections which are shown with these solid lines. So you can see two things are happening. One is that the opinions are changing. Now, after a while, you don't have the full spectrum of opinion. People are becoming more homogeneous. You have a bunch of blues and a bunch of reds. Uh, so there is less diversity. And furthermore, the structure of the network is also changing. The agents are basically sorting themselves out into these two different communities. And so the red nodes are more likely to be connected with other red nodes. The blue nodes are more likely to be connected with other blue nodes. And if you let the simulation run enough, uh, of course, there is a few parameters. I don't have time to go into too many details, but um, for reasonable values of a bunch of parameters, you always end up very robustly with this scenario where you have complete uh, polarization. That is, the opinions have now been polarized around two uh, points, and there is, uh, within each community, there is basically no heterogeneity at all. And further, the networks are completely segregated. So you basically have no chance of being exposed to an idea that is different from, from yours. So you have this, this emergence of polarized and, uh, and segregated echo chambers through only these two ingredients of social influence and unfriending. By the way, you can play with this simulation yourself. We have a demo on our website um, and, and you can play with different parameters. I think there is a... Uh, there is a question, clarification question, yeah. Yes, hi, Philip here. Thank you so much for this valuable insights. I was just wondering whether you ever ran the simulation work along multiple dimensions. So I can imagine, right, maybe politically, I'm very opposed to somebody and I'm likely to unfriend them, but maybe there's a hundred different dimensions of interest with which I'm very aligned to them, wherefore I would maybe not unfriend them. So I'm just wondering what are your expectations when we move away from this very stylized model and open this up to more realistic scenarios where it would still end up so segregated or whether maybe there may be yeah, different, different outcomes. Yeah, so we haven't done in the context of this particular simulation because we were, the focus of this, of this model was just on looking at the effect of unfriending on accelerating the emergence of these segregated echo chambers. And so we just took the simplest possible model of a single dimension. There are lots and lots of opinion dynamics models out there. There is a huge uh, literature, which you may be familiar with. And, um, and, and so there are models that look at multiple dimensions, um, even starting from the cultural models of Axelrod and so on. There is, there is a lot of work at uh, looking at what happens if you have multiple dimensions. And of course, then you have a little bit more complicated dynamics. Uh, so, but for this particular study, we haven't, uh, we haven't looked at that. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and so what this study uh, shows us is that, yes, if you have only social influence, people, opinions will still get sorted out into and, and become polarized, although this takes a much longer time. And if you have only rewiring and the opinion stays the same, uh, then also, uh, the opinions stay the same, but still there will be some emergence of normal grouping. Uh, this, is, this is inevitable because of the rules of, of the model. But if you have both of uh, social influence and rewiring, uh, and actually it doesn't matter how little, as long as it's not zero, uh, then you see that the process is greatly accelerated by an order of magnitude uh, in less time 
you have the emergence of both segregation and polarization. So uh, the take home message here is that the fact that we can so easily choose our own neighbors uh, inevitably uh, will lead to sorting ourselves out. So this is not, you know, this is this is basically inevitable based on the fact that all social media platforms pretty much have these ingredients where you can select your uh, select your friends. So um, in fact, uh, we did another study recently to look at, uh, among other things, uh, the echo chamber structure that people may find themselves in as they as they do whatever they do on on a system like Twitter. So uh, for this experiment, we actually created a bunch of bots. We call them drifters because these bots are completely neutral. They just kind of like follow you know the currents and. We just drop them on into Twitter and then just see what happens. And the behaviors of these agents is exactly identical. They all do exactly the same things, which are completely random. For example, uh, you know, follow back somebody that followed them at random or repost uh, something at random from one of their friends and things of that nature. Uh, or unfollow somebody at random and so on. They have no understanding of content whatsoever. Um, the only post that they should generate themselves is completely meaningless uh, stuff. Um, and the only difference between these agents, we put them into five groups. And uh, in each group, they started by following one news source. Uh, and that's the only difference, right? Where we drop them, right? The first action is they follow this news source. And after that, everything is automated. And so three of them started by following the nation, which is a left-leaning source. Five of them started following Washington Post, center left, and so on. Um, and then, then we saw what happens. And, um, and so what you see here is their ego networks. And generally speaking, uh, just based on where they started, that determines a lot of where they end up. So the ones who started on the left generally end up being in a, in a, in a pretty liberal um, a community. The ones who start on the right tend to end up in a very conservative community. There are a few exceptions, like uh, this this guy here. Uh, it was very interesting. We looked at what happens because it ended up in a blue echo chamber, even though it started uh, following the Wall Street Journal. And what happened is that after a while, it randomly followed CNN uh, because somebody that they were that 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 uh, that it was following shared uh, shared the link to uh, CNN. Uh, sorry, retweeted something from CNN. And then after that, it drifted to the left. Uh, but this was kind of the exception to the rule. Uh, generally speaking, we saw that uh, accounts that started from the left kind of drifted to the right, to the center, I should say. And then the ones who started on the left, uh, sorry, the ones that started on the left drifted towards the center. The, the ones that started from the right uh, went even further uh, to the right. But the important thing is that what this shows you is that given the dynamics that are happening on the information ecosystem, inevitably, uh, even if you just do random things, you're going to find yourselves inside a pretty homogeneous um, community. Uh, furthermore, we also looked at, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm, what I'm a little I'm a yeah. little confused. You, you, that, that, Go ahead. That, seemed, that seemed like a bombshell result that you kind of just uh, uh, <laughs> Passed over very quickly, but just to reiterate, things that started on the right went further to the right, and things that yes. started on the left migrated to the center. So it's, yes. it seems like there's a a trend towards right leaning yes. uh, motion. Can you yes. talk about that? Explain that for a minute. Yeah, um, yeah, we found that we uh, you know we did not have a way to unfortunately to look at. Um, the role of the algorithm itself, because we had no control on that. Um, but there is another paper recently from a bunch of people at Twitter. I don't know if you've seen it, and they actually uh, many, they actually could look at the uh, the ranking algorithm, the, the 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 feed algorithm, and they arrived to the same conclusion that uh, the feed algorithm has a right leaning bias. And it's not designed to have that bias, but it has that bias because of you know, uh, the fact that they are trying to go for virality, they're trying to go for engagement, and there is more activity on the right. Um, I will tell you in a moment that a lot of that activity comes from 
manipulation and inauthentic accounts. But in any case, there is more activity on the right. And so that's the reason I believe that this is happening because the algorithm tends to go for engagement. There is more engagement on the right. And so naturally there is a tendency to go to the right. But we observe that in our neutral bots. This, this, this is published in Nature Communications uh, not long ago. I'm happy that you think it's an interesting result. <laughs> And, and that confirmation too. from Twitter, it's, uh, yeah. it's fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I, that intuition seems, uh, you know, to pass a first, uh, logic test of yeah. engagement based. Yeah. 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 We, in fact, we did try to see if we could tell whether there was a bias in the feed itself, but again, uh, because we, we had to, we didn't have, all we could do is using the API. Uh, the API does not give you access to the ranking. It only gives you access to the feed in chronological order. And we did look at uh, the difference between the political leaning of the things that are posted by your friend, by a bot's friends, uh, and that uh, that is in the in the feed itself, in the chronological feed. And there was no bias there. There was no bias at all. So basically, the at least the chronological feed is just a reflection, a, a, a representative sample of everything posted by one's friends. But okay, despite so that, both what uh, the account sees and what the account posts, both of those shift towards the right over time, significantly. Yes. So just to just to clarify the, the the technical point you just made, the API access doesn't give you uh, access to the ranking of right. things shown. It right. just shows you a uh, corpus of all the things shown in chronological order and doesn't show you that something might have been uh, at the top of your feed right. uh, and something might not have been at the top of your feed. So you can't get that from the API, even if right. you're running a bot. You right, don't what, correct. What the bot saw you Correct. actually get to is there a way to uh to sort of program uh you know a bot's um you know visual consumption to record the 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 results of the ranking by seeing not just the chronological or uh because, that's because a very good being, question you know, like I, I you know for me you know as a human being I experience the relevance ranking by seeing yeah. things that are ranked. Right. You have a bot account that ostensibly you have access to all of that same vision. No. Um, but but somehow you're getting the data through the API rather than programming right. a watching of what the bot is seeing, and therefore you're not getting the ranking. You're correct. So that's why the study from Twitter is interesting because they specifically looked at the ranking of the bias of the ranking. Um, yeah, in our case, uh, you know, the ranking is, is visible when you use the app on a phone or on the web, but uh, what you can do through the app is you can get the feed and the feed is simply the most recent post by your friends. So we basically, we simulated the process where the bot wakes up at some time of the day and looks at the feed and you know we downloaded let's say the 200 most recent uh, tweets that would have appeared in that feed but we it was they they're not ranking in the way that if you and i would have looked at our feed they they would have been we don't have access to that um the your question about how one could get around that it would require uh, a, a a more sophisticated approach where you basically uh scrape uh, the the content uh, that is seen by the bot and that requires that you have to run you know the javascript um, so it, it's more complicated i think right now there are some tools that are trying to help doing that but it's still not um, it's still something that is not easy to do it also would probably be in violation of the terms which we try not to do. <laughs> uh, so that's that's why we decided to stick with the with what we would, could get from the API. But despite that, uh, the effect is there. So if you combine yeah. our results with that, those from the recent paper from Twitter, you would find that they even reinforce each other, right? Because the bias yeah, goes in the same direction for both of them. Yep. 
Yeah, Bill, I just wanted to you. sneak in to give you your 20 minutes. Ooh, okay, I need to, okay, thank you, thank you. I need to uh, uh, accelerate a little bit. Let me just say that another interesting finding is that for those, the bots here are the yellow nodes. Uh, and you can see that the red nodes are bigger. So that means that uh, the, 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 the bots that were in these conservative echo chambers were also exposed to more misinformation. The size here is the fraction of links to low credibility sources. And here you can see that very, very directly. The top plot show you, shows you the um, percentage of links that were to low credibility sources, and it's much higher on one side. Even though on the bottom, it shows you that there was an echo chamber structure, a high clustering coefficient on both sides, both for the left leaning and the right leaning uh, uh, box. So the take home message here is that uh, there is vulnerability when you're in a, when you're in a political echo chamber, a partisan echo chamber, you're more vulnerable to uh, misinformation. That happens on the right and on the left, but it happens more strongly on the right. It's not, it's not symmetric. So here on the x-axis, you have basically the political leaning, and on the y-axis, you have the percentage of links shared that go to low credibility sources. So how can you hack this, right? If you know, OK, if I can have a very dense echo chambers, then I can spread things very, very fast. And so, in fact, there is this phenomenon of follow trains that have existed since the beginning of Twitter. You may remember, uh, you know, Follow Friday. Uh, but now that is being manipulated on both sides of the political spectrum, where there is a few accounts, we call them conductors, and they generate high volumes of tweets that are, consist of long lists of accounts with the meaning that everybody who follows them should also follow these other accounts. And we call these the passengers. And so this is a way to very quickly gather followers for new accounts that are generated and added to these groups so that the, the, uh, the cluster keeps growing and it keeps getting denser and denser. So we look at the structure of this, uh, 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 of this um, echo chamber, it's very hierarchical. These conductors are in the center, they're extremely influential. And um, uh, the, compared to some reasonable ba baseline, uh, they uh, they increase the number of friends at uh, sorry the number of uh, friends and also followers at a very high rate. So the ratio between the two stays almost constant, and that's the, the name of the game because uh, Twitter has a limit on that ratio. Uh, after you you follow five thousand people, you can't follow more unless you have more followers. And so this mechanism allows you to get around that and follow more people and get followed by more people. And we actually could see the effect of a mention in one of those uh, follow trains. If you compare the number of followers that an account has before and after it is mentioned in one of these train tweets, uh, the increase, the median increase is uh, 600%. Uh, so, so this is a very effective method to grow, uh, to grow uh, the echo chamber. And, and that's a way to hack the system because then, because of the things that I was talking about earlier, Everything that spreads in that group very, very quickly spreads to the rest of, of, the, of the group. Okay, so that's about the network. Now let me use the remaining time to talk about engagement. Uh, so we could use one of these, uh, of these models to, like in the previous models that I showed you, uh, you know, each meme or link or hashtag was just a random number, right? So there was no notion of quality. But of course, we tend to share things that we think are more interesting. So what if we add that ingredient to the model and you say that uh, the probability of sharing a meme uh, or hashtag link, whatever it is, is proportional to its quality. So people can tell the quality and preferentially share good stuff. Well, so now it's all about the finite attention. It, it, so the scenario on the left is one in which there is very low information load or very high attention, which means that basically you get to see everything that your friends post before choosing what to share. And in this model, you share the better stuff. So what you find is a high correlation between quality and popularity. The size of the node here represents the quality of the memes being shared. So all of these are all big fat nodes. So, so what this shares is that there's a few high quality things that are, that are going viral. That's good, right? High correlation between quality and popularity. But as you increase the information load or decrease uh, the individual attention, which are equivalent, so that people can only see a fraction of what is posted on their feed before they decide what to reshare, now the correlation between popularity and quality goes way down. 
So you see a lot of small nodes here. These are basically nodes that are sharing junk. And this is despite the fact that people are trying to do the right thing. But uh, because of their limited attention, a lot of junk goes viral. Um, and so that's from the point of view of, you know, of a system in which there is no ranking. Okay, in that model, uh, ranking was chronological. Now let's add one more ingredient to this model, which is engagement-based ranking. So in other words, we assume that the platform have some access to quality um, signals, but with some probability they use that and or with some probability they use popularity, okay? So on the X axis here is the popularity bias of the algorithm. The likelihood that something gets shared more if it is more popular, if it has been shared by more people. And then on the Z axis, you have the average quality of all the information that is spreading in the network. What you see here that in general, the higher the popularity bias of the algorithm, the lower the average quality in the system, okay? Now there is one little exception. There is a narrow range of attention here where a small amount of popularity bias actually increases the average quality a little bit, this yellow band. That's the wisdom of the crowd effect. Uh, this is the reason why platforms, of course, uh, uh, allegedly use popularity bias because they can pick up the signal. If a lot of people like something, it's probably good. Well, in some narrow situation, that's true so that we can more quickly amplify the good stuff. But even in that case, if you increase the popularity even more, the popularity bias even more, eventually the quality goes way down. So generally speaking, the trend is that the focus on engagement uh, by algorithms drives the quality down and lowers the correlation between popularity and quality. Uh, incidentally, platforms do have access to quality signals. In fact, this has been revealed recently with, by the whistleblower. Uh, prior to the 2020 election, they tuned down the engagement uh, bias and they increased the quality bias and the platform had much less misinformation. Uh, here, uh, this is a paper that just came out recently uh, where uh, we look at one of these potential uh, um, pop, uh, quality signals. And this is the audience diversity of the sources. We find that if we change the ranking algorithm, the recommendation algorithm by uh, pumping up sources that have more of a politically diverse audience, we can improve the quality of the feed. And especially for uh, the groups that are more vulnerable. So for example, those that uh, consume more extreme information, uh, those that consume more information, those that um, uh, consume, uh, uh, visit more, uh, more websites uh, or that visit more low trust uh, websites. So for those people, uh, the quality would, uh, would significantly increase. Uh, okay, so, so far I'm talking from the point of view of the platform, but what about the, pla the point of view of the users? How does engagement affect uh, the, the, the user's attention? Uh, so to explore this question, we ran an experiment using Fakey, which is an app that we developed for uh, uh, news literacy. Basically, it's, it's a game where you, show, where you see a feed just like the one that you would see on your own Twitter account or your own fake, uh, uh, Facebook account. And you see news articles, some are from uh, mainstream sources, some are from low credibility sources, and you have to decide whether to share them or, or flag them for fact checking. And you, you get points for doing the right thing. Phil, just so, giving you your 10 minute warning. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So what we did in this experiment, we manipulated the, uh, the number that tells people how many others have shared something. And we found an interesting result that when you look at low credibility articles, people were more likely to share it if they thought that it, it had had high engagement, that it had been shared by a lot of other people. And again, they were less likely to fact check articles from low credibility sources if they thought that it had been shared by other people. So here you have the fact that if you think that something is, is, is viral or popular, you are more likely to pay attention to it. But we just saw that the algorithm does the same. So what we have is a vicious cycle where if you can somehow make something appear a little bit more popular than it is, 
then both the algorithm will pick it up, will show it to more people. People will say, oh, more people are sharing it. So then they will share it more and that feeds the algorithm and so on. So we have a vicious cycle where some initial fluctuation can be amplified. So how can we manipulate that initial fluctuation? Well, of course, I can go into the system. I can create a fake account, whether it's automated or not. I can pay someone. And, uh, and so that's why we've done a lot of work on, on inauthentic accounts, coordination, and, and social bots. We've done this since oh, more than 10 years ago. I'm going to skip this stuff uh, because I'm a little bit uh, behind on time. But basically, as I said before, we have uh, machine learning tools to assess the likelihood that an account is, uh, is automated. And so what we observe is that uh, when you look at the sharing of low credibility sources, which are shown in purple here, versus sharing of reliable sources, in this case from fact-checking sources, which are shown in, in, um, in orange here, you see that there is also an echo chamber of misinformation. Those that are more likely to share misinformation are more likely to reshare stuff from neighbors that are also vulnerable. And then when you zoom in into the into the core of this misinformation cluster, uh, you find more and more evidence of the presence of automated accounts, which is what this plot shows you. So in other words, inauthentic accounts, of course, are kind of embedded in this misinformation networks. And we even see it with our, with our drifter bots. The ones that are in the more partisan echo chambers uh, tend to follow more bots themselves. Uh, so what do these bots do? They try to attract the attention of very influential users, uh, try to get them to retweet stuff. I don't have much time to show, to go through this example here, um, uh, but, but, but this is true in general. Accounts that are more likely to be automated are more likely to mention very, very popular account trying to get something to get retweeted and go viral. And the other thing that automated accounts, of course, can do, they can flood, they can flood the network, right? You can have this plot on the, Top right shows you that the same account can share the same link to the same fake news article thousands and thousands of times. So their effect is one of amplification. Uh, most retweets come from humans. That's what the plot at the top shows. But if you look at who those humans are retweeting, you can see that they are when they are sharing low credibility um, links uh, uh, they are sharing humans but they're sorry they're retweeting humans but they're also retweeting other bots so the role of the bots here is one of amplifying exposing humans and then humans will retweet uh, last bit uh, is okay now that we know that uh, that basically um, using inauthentic uh, accounts you can generate that amplification which then gets picked up by uh, cognitive bias of the users and algorithmic biases of the platforms. How do you do that? How can you generate a lot of content? Well, one thing that you can do is you can generate content and then delete it. And what we have found is that there is a huge amount of tweets that get deleted every day. Uh, and there are some accounts that delete systematically content at very high volume every day. And in fact, if you look at the, 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 the tweets that are generated by an account that can be visible through, through the API, plus the ones that they delete, we find a whole lot of accounts that are able to evade Twitter's limit. Twitter has a limit of 2,400 tweets per day, which if you ask me is way too high. <laughs> Why should somebody be allowed to post 2,400 tweets per day? But you know, in my opinion, it should be like five. <laughs> But even that 2,400 limit is evaded because accounts can post a couple thousand tweets, then delete them after 15 minutes and then post another couple uh, thousand. Because after a while, it doesn't matter. If people haven't seen it, they probably won't see it. And so this is a way to flood the network. And there are accounts that can post up to hundreds of thousands of tweets per day with this trick of deleting content. Not only that, but uh, we also found these groups of coordinated accounts where there is one account, which is shown in blue or purple here, that posts something, then a whole bunch of other accounts that like it and unlike it, like it and unlike it, many, many, many times, hundreds of times, okay? Um, and then 
at the end of the day, the original one removes that tweet. Okay, so this is clearly a manipulation attempt. This is trying to get things to go viral, to go trending, or to trick the algorithm to assume that there is engagement around this content and to push it so that more people will see it. And then at the end, you can, after whatever effect has happened, you can remove the evidence. Now, again, uh, this doesn't have to be done just by automated accounts. This can be done by humans who are coordinated. So if I show you this account, for example, you might say that there is nothing weird. It's just a political activist anti-Trump. But now if I show you a bunch of different accounts, you might say, hmm, these look suspiciously similar. And, and in fact, they are. They're all controlled by a single person who's controlling these different accounts and claims to be, in some cases, a pro-Trump account, in some cases, an anti-Trump account. And it does so to basically to commit fraud, to, to say that it's raising money on behalf of different campaigns. So this is an example of a coordinated uh, campaign. And we also build models to see what is the effect of these campaigns. If you can, if you can, get a, 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 if you can create a group of accounts that you control and target a community by, by getting some of these people to follow, it, follow you, can you do damage? And then if you post junk, can you lower the overall quality of information in the, in the community? And the answer is yes. And in fact, the infiltration turns out to be a really important parameter. If the, if the fake accounts that you control are kind of peripheral, then you don't have much of an effect. But if the accounts can really infiltrate the network and get a lot of the humans to follow them back, then uh, you can lower the overall quality uh, of information that is spreading in the community. You can see that by the color here. Black means low quality, right? So you see that now a lot of the humans, the little nodes have become black from comparing left to right. So that means that the, 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 the fake um, or coordinated group has suppressed quality. And we see these kind of coordinated campaigns everywhere. Uh, whether we look at accounts that are sharing, uh, sharing handles to evade detection uh, or accounts that are sharing at the same time, for example, for pump and dump schemes for cryptocurrencies or accounts that are sharing the same images in the same sequence. And we've seen examples of that uh, in the Hong Kong protests uh, or accounts that uh, retweet the same, uh, the same accounts or, or the same tweets in a suspicious way spreading, for example, COVID misinformation and so on. Uh, of course, we observe this in politics a lot. In this case, sometimes you get kids that are paid to just copy and paste content uh, and we detect them because the content is suspiciously similar. Or uh, very often people who donate their credentials, they'll say, here, you political action committee can tweet on my behalf. Here's my... I authorize your app to post on my behalf. And so we find these clusters uh, of accounts that are posting basically exactly the same content. Uh, and we even see it on Facebook, not, not only on Twitter. Recently, we were able to do this kind of analysis on Facebook. And we also find suspicious groups that are basically posting in a coordinated fashion at the same time, the same links to the same set of low credibility uh, sources. So we build tools. Um, I've shown you um, Bottometer. That's one example. Another example that we're working on right now is Bot Slayer, which is uh, we're trying to allow anyone to basically detect these coordinated campaigns in real time. Uh, so this example at the bottom here is one example where we were using the system and all of a sudden we saw all of these Russian bots trying to amplify a fake uh, news video that was attacking Bill Browder. Um, and then within less than a minute, Twitter took down all of those bots. So sometimes Twitter is doing the right thing often, uh, but it's good for researchers to be able to see this stuff while, 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 while it happens. So that's why we're working on that. All right, I'm out of time. So just to summarize, um, so network community structure, complex contagion, echo chambers, limited attention, engagement bias, and her behavior. These all are factors that uh, have an impact on online virality and bad actors can exploit them, can turn these factors into vulnerabilities that can be hacked to amplify misinformation or manipulate uh, opinions. 
ah, this is a shameless plug from my textbook, but let me uh, finish by uh, acknowledging my wonderful students and uh, collaborators. This is their work that I showed you. And also thanks to our, uh, to our uh, funders. Okay, I hope there is still cool. enough time for questions. Well, thank you so much. This, is, this has been fantastic. Quick question. Um, what's yes. next? What, what, is the, what is the current and future research look like for you? What, do you what, is the, what are the important big questions that you're working on? What, what, what are the current projects? What are the soon to be uh, hot projects for you? Thank you. Uh, lots and lots of things. Uh, right now, we have some work groups that are looking at the um, um, effect, trying to link online and offline effects of misinformation, especially in the case of uh, health. So we actually have a paper coming out in exactly one week, uh, next Tuesday. Um, and where we, uh, when we did, we, we tried to link uh, epidemic and infodemic uh, at a geographical level. So we geotagged tweets and we looked at whether they were in a certain state or a certain county. And then we try to correlate that with um, vaccine hesitancy uh, using the Facebook uh, Delphi uh, survey or um, vaccine uptake from the CDC. And we find that there is a strong uh, association, even when you take into account confounding factors like politics, which is very well known to have a very strong correlation. And now it's hard to do causal analysis here, of course, because we don't have individuals, we're not in the lab and so on. But there is work by others who have shown some effects in the lab, Lumba et al. And also we did some Granger causality analysis showing that you can predict with much higher accuracy that there's gonna be a spike in hesitancy in a particular county a few days after you observe a spike in misinformation on Twitter in that county. So that's a very interesting effect. Um, so you know, it's a, it's not it's not causality; it's forecast. But nevertheless, uh, we are sort of building a body of evidence for for these effects, and that's I think that's a very important direction for research. Um, another student right now is trying to do something related to, um, you know, looking at uh, misinformation about certain drugs, you know, like ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine. And seeing connections between information on Twitter about that and um, and adverse effects, so this is one big question. Like connect connect what we see on you know try to quantify uh, real world effect of online misinformation. Then we are all, always uh, we're always interested in looking at new types of abuse, um, uh, and. Uh, we're also very interested in super spreaders. This is something that I think you, you are also interested in and we hope to have some preliminary results to share with you soon. Uh, I promised you a long time ago, but uh, we're, we're working on that. Um, we're trying to find ways to detect effective super spreaders and super amplifiers um, in an efficient way. Uh, we think that that's a really important, um, important direction as well. Oh, yeah. Got yeah. me. So, Sanan, you're on mute. Still, still on mute. Sorry, I was going to say uh, Mike wants to ask a question. I was, Got I it. was asking it, but yeah, go ahead. Mike, liver right. Okay, I was just wondering two things. One was to say that. Uh, uh, let's see, can a user in various root, um, sites that he uses to gather things put in a post processor to reorganize the order that uh, data comes in based on his own, uh, some measures of quality, um, uh, bias, robustness, et cetera? So that if I have a feed, either a, a Google search or a um, Twitter, et cetera, that I can say, okay, let's a post process it and reorder it so that the best sites are at the top. So if so you're asking whether end users could do this. Yes. Um, so technically speaking, I think it is possible uh, if you're using the web to access these platforms, uh, you can have a 
um, a browser extension that uh, alters your feed. And so there have been a bunch of browser extensions that have been developed. So as an example, we had one, somebody developed a browser extension on top of our bottom meter tool so that it would just sort of, um, uh, you know, obfuscate tweets that seem to be coming from bots. This was several years ago. It's not working anymore. But so I, th that's why I know that it's technically possible. Um, now, some platforms may like that and some platforms may not like it. These extensions rely on being able to parse information, basically scrape information from the browser, uh, which is not trivial uh, because the platforms can make a small change to the format and break, uh, and break the extension. And so that's what uh, very often Google has done, for example, with these kind of... Uh, uh, of, of extensions. To do it on a mobile is much harder. And most people these days access information from mobile and not from the web. Um, I, and and that's, that's much, much harder because you have to be, basically build your own client and uh, platforms, in, in some cases, platform may be happy with that. And in some cases, they may not. Um, then of course there is the more the, the more difficult part of your question is like how how do you rank uh, you know uh, can we do better than Twitter can we do better than Google and Facebook um, maybe in some ways we can in in other ways maybe not uh, that's an open question you you know what you might consider your best ranking algorithm might be very different from from what um, Sinan might like uh, you know or Carrie or me. Right. What I'm trying to do is say, let us assume I trust some other site which ranks mm -hmm. uh, third, par third parties in their order. And can I put in a filter which says, uh, say, Twitter gives me a rank or Google gives me a rank. Now let me take that rank based on a site I trust to rank sites differently, mm -hmm. conservative, liberal, trust or not, feed that ranking through a, maybe a sequence of those sightings in my profile yeah. to reorder my thing where I believe my ranking and the sites I trust more than Google. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, technically it's possible. Yeah, sorry, Sinan. Sorry, I, I was just gonna say, I think uh, that's a really, Good question. I think um, I think it's a good question to take more offline, Mike, because I think there's just a, one or two more questions. Uh, right. There was one question. That's okay. No problem. I think uh, Phil Phil answered that a little bit, but you guys can definitely talk about it more sure. offline. I, I certainly would love to know the answer because that sounds like a great idea. Maybe. Yeah apply it to my own feed, but there was a question about where exactly is the paper on vaccine hesitancy being published on Tuesday? And then Dave Rand has a question. Uh, Nature Scientific Reports. Okay, great. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Dave Rand? Thanks. Yes. Yeah, super interesting, Phil. Um, you know, I've seen all of this stuff and it's nice to see it yeah. all put together Thanks. here. Um, the thing that I am um, have been struggling with personally, and that this I feel like this talk high, uh, you know highs to me is we have all this evidence on uh, what look like echo chambers on like preferential assortment on, on networks, but then there's all this work from people like Andy Guess mm -hmm. uh, that says that actually they're like echo chambers aren't a thing, and mm -hmm. people most people aren't in echo chambers and yeah. what they're doing with echo chambers, and I don't know how to resolve like how, yeah. how do we reconcile these. Yeah, yeah. Views. This is a very good question. I get it a lot. <laughs> Echo chamber is a super loaded term and different people mean very, very different things by it. Uh, I, I learned this uh, a few years ago, uh, talking with some communications uh, colleagues and, and, you know, we were kind of talking past each other and then eventually we realized, okay, we were really talking about completely different things, but we thought that we were talking about the same thing because we use the same term. So what I mean by echo chamber is a network that is uh, dense and has lots of triangles. So it's the network definition of community where, the, the, where there is a high level of homophily. That is there, two, net, two nodes that are connected are much more likely to be similar along some dimensions that we get to define. 
um, uh, than two nodes that are not in the same uh, cluster. Uh, so according to that definition of echo chamber, which in my opinion is sort of a well, uh, well-formed mathematical definition, then I think nobody would disagree uh, that there are strong echo chambers on Twitter and Facebook because it's trivial to, to observe them. You, you cannot not observe them. They, they are incredibly strong. Uh, you know, you just collect a bunch of tweets and Facebook on, on anything about politics and you will observe that they exist. Now, uh, other people may say that echo chamber means that you have no access to information, let's say, to new sources from an, another group. I would not make that claim. I, I think that under that definition, then you would probably say that echo chamber effect is not very strong at all. And, and I would agree with that. But, but, so isn't, for example, isn't, the reason, but isn't the reason that, that one is, would be concerned about homophilus networks is because it leads the information that you're exposed to to be homophilus, essentially, yeah, yes. to be like uh, restricted? Yes, yeah. Yes, yes. So what I was just about to say, so uh, I may be aware that let's say that I'm in a liberal echo chamber and I see, I don't know, I, I'm on CNN, let's say it's liberal central left source, let's say, um, and it says Trump, um, you know, did something and I don't like Trump. So I say, aha, I knew it. I knew it is a jerk, whatever. Um, now, that might even have a link to, let's say, an article from Fox News. Uh, and, and the tweet says, you know, Fox News is evil, whatever. So I am exposed to Fox News and I know what they are posting. But the way that I'm exposed to it is through the lens of my group. Uh, let me show you, let me tell you another example. Earlier, I showed you this big cluster of um, misinformation sharing network and then the uh, fact checking network. There are a lot of the fact checks are also spreading in the misinformation network. And so we wanted to see like, why are people who are spreading a lot of misinformation are also spreading links to uh, fact checks that say that that misinformation is false. And we found that all of those cases fall, fell into two categories. One where somebody would say, oh, look at this link from Snopes. They are completely biased. You should not believe them. They are left wing. So basically they had the link to Snopes, but it was in the context of a criticism that accused them of being non-credible. Scenario number two, somebody would post a false claim, for example, uh, Clinton is involved in bizarre satanic rituals, and then they would have a link to, let's say, PolitiFact, and they would say, even PolitiFact says it, and if you actually clicked on the link, you would go to the PolitiFact fact check that says, no, it's not true, Clinton is not, is not eating children. <laughs> But they count on the fact that the people in that echo chamber that they are addressing are not going to click on the link. They're just gonna say, oh yeah, <clears throat> if even the fact the left-leaning fact checker says it, it must be true. <clears throat> so even though I may be aware of the news that come from the other side, I see it in the lens of my own community. And so in my view, that's still kind of an echo chamber. But if you ask somebody in echo chamber, are they aware of what's going on in the other side? They will say yes. They may be very well informed. A conservative, a, somebody in the super conservative MAGA echo chamber may be very well aware of what's being posted in the New York Times. And somebody in the ultra liberal resist echo chamber may be very well aware of what's being said on Fox News. So that's my interpretation of the difference. So depending on how you define the echo chamber, you may, you may come to completely different Thank All right. Thanks. Well, we, we are about uh, five minutes over. It's no surprise because this was super interesting, Phil. Uh, really, really important work for many, many years. Uh, you know, world's leader on this topic. And that's why we were so uh, very excited to have you come and speak. Really appreciate uh, the update and also the recap. As David Rand said, I, I feel like uh, we have read many of these papers 
uh, but seeing them all together sort of uh, gives us a, a more full understanding of, of the body of work. Uh, so really, really appreciate it. And really thank you for that. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank look you for forward to me. reading more of these papers. Just want to remind everybody that we have another seminar uh, Thursday, April 21st. Um, Scott Komeners from uh, Harvard Business School. So look out for that one. Thank, thank you to everybody for uh, attending. Uh, and I uh, hope to see you all very soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks again for having me. Thank you, Phil. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.